Yes, thank you, uh, Nicola, for introducing me. Aha, uh -huh. what's that? Uh -huh. Now it's okay. So, yes, I'm probably famous for developing one of the main solid state codes uh, in, in the field of density functional theory, despite Despite this, these talks I will present here are not at all about uh, density functional theory. They really concentrate on methods beyond density functional theory, and in particular, on methods that are suitable for weakly correlated systems. I've looked at the program. You've heard a lot about uh, strongly correlated systems. As far as I can tell, weakly correlated systems have not been particularly on the forefront. Uh, and actually, the first talk is the most difficult talk. The other ones are kind of more easygoing. They will get, just give you a kind of easy introduction. But the first talk is a tough talk. And I think part of you, maybe half of you, probably know all things I present here. But so then this is kind of a recapture of what you might know. And I guess the other half might not know about it. And I, I can only tell you that I can give you only a teaser that hopefully will give an incentive for you to look into this series into these uh, really very basic series and actually explore them and read more carefully about them. I think these are really the very basics. Essentially what I'm talking about in the first talk is uh, quantum field theory, quantum field methods, and many-body perturbation theory. So it's really important here this word many-body perturbation theory it implies that we actually work in the weakly correlated regime. So we don't deal with strongly correlated electrons. So first an outline. Uh, in the solid state community, first principle simulations are usually done with density functional theory. And I will try to explain why not only density functional theory should be used, or why we have to look into methods that go beyond density functional theory. And essentially, my, my favorite, or what I've been doing in the last 10 years is really many body perturbation theory. And I will try to give you essentially an intro to this many body perturbation theory. And this is really, I think, if you want to do model Hamiltonian strong correlation, you probably have learned about this. But I think it's really important to understand the basics before moving on to strong correlation. So there's never, ever any strong correlation here. Uh, so what I will talk about is essentially the particle whole picture. So I will talk about uh, second quantization. I'll give you an intro to that. I will then talk about the Gelman Low theorem the Wick theorem, and finally about the link cluster theorem. This is the very basic, and I will try to be pedagogical, but it's the first time I do this, at least in one and a half hour. And I know it's almost impossible to do it in one and a half hour. So again, it can only give you a kind of idea. I will then come to Goldstone diagrams and introduce those as a way to actually represent the many body perturbations here. And you will see in the later talks that I will almost exclusively use Goldstone diagrams to talk about what we do in solid states nowadays. Very briefly also about Feynman diagrams, but I might skip that. If you find these subjects interesting, there are a lot of quite good books to read. Uh, they are usually in quantum chemistry. Sabo Oston, this famous book in quantum chemistry that you might want to read. Shavit and Bartlett, Many Body Methods in Chemistry and Physics. And this is a more quantum field theoretical implementation, quantum field theory for the gifted. And I must say I haven't read those. These are the books that my students read. Also, I must say that these slides have been mostly prepared by Felix Hummer, who just finishes his PhD work. I simply had no time to do it myself. So let's go to the very basics. So I'm interested in first principle simulations. I want to do simulations that don't involve any, Hamilton, any model Hamiltonians, but that really set out from the many electron Schrodinger equation. And this here is the many electron Schrodinger equation written down. Uh, so we, I will just briefly summarize it because I'm pretty sure you have seen this before. We have here a sum i that goes over all, I, over all electrons. Yes, i is the sum over all electrons from 1 to n. This is the number of electrons we have in our system. This here is the kinetic energy operator, the Laplacian operating on the coordinate ri. This second term, well, this is essentially kinetic energy. The second term describes the interaction between the nuclei and the electrons. And again, it involves the sum of all uh, ele electronic coordinates. And now the nuclear electron potential is to be evaluated at the position of each uh, electron. And the final term here, and this is the most relevant one because it's the culprit, it causes all the troubles we have, is 
the electrostatic interactions between electron I and electron J. The sum is usually restricted to all J indices being larger than the index I, and the index I runs again from one to the number of electrons. So if you solve this equation, you have to determine this quantity here. This is the many electron wave function, yeah? And the number of coordinates you have here is proportional to the number of electrons, and this should be a capital N to agree uh, with the slide above. And essentially, it tells you that this is going to be really a hard problem. Actually, the solution of the many electron Schrodinger equation is an exponentially hard problem. So the compute time that you need to calculate that quantity scales exponentially with the particle number. OK, uh, that's already obvious if you just inspect this many electron wave function. Imagine that you have one electron, a single electron, and you create a, a grid to represent the density or the uh, wave function of this electron. So you introduce it. Here's a two-dimensional grid. You discretize, uh, essentially, the electrons in space. And we introduce a three-dimensional grid with 10 by 10 by 10 grid points in each direction. Then, obviously, this quantity will involve something like 10 by 10 by 10. Yeah, something like 16 kilobytes, 1,000 words, you multiply about, uh, yeah, why 16 here? Well, just take it about 16 kilobytes. Yeah, why 16 kilobytes? What's that? Probably more like 4 or 8 kilobytes. Well, it's complex. If you use complex data and double precision, it's indeed 16 kilobytes. So this can be done fairly easily. That's almost trivial. But let's imagine we have three electrons. Then we have one, two, three coordinates, R1, R2, R3. And each one is x, y, z, so x1, x2, x3, uh, y1, y2, 1, y3, and so on and so on. And so that means you have a nine-dimensional grid to represent the quantity. And imagine, again, we have complex double precision. Then we need something like 16 gigabytes. That's still manageable. So that's still what we can do on quite good computers. But let's move to something like five electrons. Then we need a 15-dimensional grid. And that's already 16,000 terabytes. So that's not what you can store in, even on a modern high-performance computer. So it means to store this quantity, this many electron wave function is per se impossible. So Walter Cohn had uh, a nice idea to uh, slim the problem down. And that's density functional theory. That's quite routinely used in solid state physics. Essentially, the idea is that for five electrons, you don't use one 15-dimensional grid. But instead, you try to represent these five electrons by one electron wave functions by so-called orbitals. So you have only five sets. And each of these sets is just three-dimensional. So the first one, the lowest one, represents uh, the lowest electron. The second uh, orbital represents the second electron. The fourth orbital represents the fourth electron, and so on. And essentially, each of these sets is only three-dimensional. That makes it, of course, much easier uh, to work with the equation than with the original equation. It's no longer exponential. It's essentially scaling, usually cubically, with system size. Uh, just a brief history of time. He was actually born in Vienna, but he left uh, Austria when the Nazis moved uh, to Austria. And he was lucky to be saved. And he was able, he was actually rescued to Canada by so-called kinder transport. And actually, he declined and said he's not an Austrian. He's really he has been educated in the US, and so he's an American. He got, as you might know, the Nobel Prize in 1998 for this kind of theory. So this is the equation that you then solve. It's a one electron part, one electron equation. So this guy here is essentially only dependent on a single coordinate, no longer on these many coordinates we had before, on this awful quantity. But it only depends on a single electronic coordinate. And that makes it much more easy. Complexity is essentially n cube. So I want to give you first a few why density functional theory is in principle a great theory. In practice, it's hard to use. So what you do is actually, or the problem is density functional theory is that you have something that is called exchange correlation potential. And this exchange correlation potential captures all the many electron effects that you have in your material. So here you have, again, a kinetic energy term that now operates only on this single coordinate. Here's the nuclear electron potential, and that you describe exactly. There's no trouble with that. You have a Hartree potential that describes the electrostatic interactions between the electrons. And finally, you have one term that embeds all the complicated many electron interactions. But that necessarily is an approximation. And the approximation most people use is some variant of the local density approximation. So you discretize in space. 
And then you look at the electron density at one particular grid point. Yeah? So you look at the electron density at this grid point, and you check a table. What would be the correlation energy, the exchange correlation energy, for the homogeneous electron gas at this density? So all you need is a table that maps the local density to the local exchange correlation energy density. That's all you need as an input. And that's a pretty awkward approximation and a very odd one indeed. So you map actually local properties onto the local exchange correlation energy, and you do this via the homogeneous electron gas. Nowadays, functionals not only depend on the density, but also on the gradient of the density S or the kinetic energy density. But think about this kind of approximation. What does it really imply? Uh, imagine that you have two electrons, one electron here on the left side of the nucleus, then the other electron is on the other side of the nucleus. You know that that's kind of what electrons do. They want to avoid each other. That's the effect of Pauli repulsion. It's also the effect of Coulomb repulsion, right? Electrons repel each other because of the Coulomb repulsion. Because they are fermions, they will never be at the sa in the same orbital. And if one electron is to the left, the other one is to the right. And they're kind of moving in a concerted fashion. So if this electron moves over, the other electron moves over there. But how can you capture something like that with a local density approximation where you look only at the density at one space point? That's kind of impossible, right? But it's approximately possible. And this kind of correlated, I call, always call it a correlated dense or entanglement, as people call it in quantum information theory, is at the very heart of correlation. So electrons are correlated when one electron is to the left, the other one will try to avoid this region and move over to the right. More precisely, it's more likely to find it on the other side than to find it at the same place. This is intrinsically non-local, and also in principle, one could do it with DFD. It's very difficult to obtain this information from the density alone. OK, this sounds esoteric, but let's give you some examples where similar things do happen. Van der Waals interactions. We have two nuclei now, one nucleus here and another nucleus here. And let's say we have two electrons. Yeah? So one electron always sits around this nucleus, and the other electron always sees, uh, sits around that nucleus. Now what happens is that these two electrons again move in a concerted fashion. So if this electron is on top here, so it is more likely to be found up here above the nucleus, then the other electron, interestingly, will be usually preferentially also above here, above the nucleus. And they will move in a concerted fashion. So if this guy moves over, so if it kind of moves over to the other side of the nucleus here, then this electron will, in a concerted entangled fashion, also move down. That's what you know. It's actually nothing but van der Waals interaction. So this is exactly van der Waals interaction, that these two electrons really move in this concerted fashion around the nucleus. And that lowers the energy because you have a dipole here, another dipole there, and in some yeah, kind of a positive dipole interaction is lower than energy. It's another case that is really difficult to describe with density functions here. There are a lot of fixes now where you inspect the density at two points in space, but anyway, in a ballpark, this is a property that is pretty much difficult to describe with density function theory. I want to be a little bit more precise. What we can also look at is the wave function as a function of the difference between two coordinates. We have this many electron wave function of two coordinates, and now we look at the wave function as a function of the difference between two coordinates. So these are two electronic coordinates, R1 minus R2, and we look at the wave function as a function of the difference of two coordinates. And there are two important features in this wave function. One is this cusp here. Well, let's look at, uh, uh, at electrons with equal spin, then you know the wave function must be antisymmetric. If the electrons have the same spin, two, two electrons with the same spin, the wave function is antisymmetric, so there's zero probability to find the second electron in this place. But there's another correlation effect, and that's essentially a combination of Coulomb and kinetic, and that's called the cusp. Yeah? So even if electrons have a different spin, if they, if they have a different spin, you don't need to consider antisymmetry in space because you have it in spin coordinates. But even then, there is some peculiar property at r is equal to zero, and that's called cusp. It kind of expels the electrons essentially by a combination of kinetic and Coulomb repulsion here close to the nucleus. Oh, sorry, not close to the nucleus, but close to the coalescence point where r1 becomes r2. It's called cusp. It's very famous in quantum chemistry. Another thing is that if one electron sits here, there is 
a greater likelihood to find the other electron at certain regions in space and less likelihood to find the electrons at another region, at another state point. This is exactly what I told you about here. If one electron sits here, it's more likely to find that you find one electron here. This is this area here. And it's less likely to find an electron over there. Yeah. So it's very likely to find it here. This is this place. Less likely to find it there. So all these effects you would like to describe somehow. And that's really, really tough with density functional theory. So all this is clearly very non-local, you see. All these effects, these kind of correlation effects, DFD handles this short range effects pretty well, but the large range, large distance effects are almost impossible to treat. So, let's do something else. And this, is my mo this was my motivation, and now I will try to derive a more rigorous framework how to deal with electronic co correlation. It's not density functional theory. It's essentially uh, many body perturbation theory. And I will try to step through the basic theories and later in the other talks, I will come back to this and use the kind of algebra I've, I've developed today, the algebra I've developed today, and apply it actually to different levels of theory, how to actually use it in practice. So we want to solve, we want to go back to our original equation. We don't want to use DFT. We don't want to use this equation because it has its limitations. We want to use this equation here, which is really the exact manual electron Schrodinger equation. So, no DFT from now on. And here's again our many electron Schrodinger equation. I want to do materials so I don't deal with model Hamiltonians. I want to do what is exactly written down by Schrodinger and Heisenberg. So I want to use essentially this exact equation and apply it to materials. So this is the kinetic energy operator again, sum over all electrons, and I've not dropped this electron index. So this sum runs from I to the number of electrons. Uh, the Laplacian operates on each coordinates. This is, again, the nuclear electron interaction. Uh, this here is now the position coordinate. Sorry for this mix-up. So there should be x and r should be identical. So this should be also an x here. Great. So I've, I've walked carefully through all sides, but now that I've presented, I, I still find mistakes. Yeah. So this should be an x here. This here, again, is the description of the Coulomb repulsion between two electrons, and that's the interaction between the nuclear and the electron. So the simplest way to deal with this exact equation is to use an ansatz for the Mellian electron wave function. And the simplest ansatz you can do is the Hartree-Fock approximation. So in the Hartree-Fock approximation, you make an approximation for the Mellian electron wave function, which is a single slater determinant. So you insert, you plug into this here an ansatz for this wave function, and that's a single slater determinant. And a single slater determinant is essentially, uh, yeah, it's a product ansatz. It's a very simplified form for the wave function. So uh, this later determinant is, uh, is actually written here. This is an anti-symmetrization operator. And we have now only index 1 to the number of electrons orbital. And each orbital depends on a single coordinate. So your simple ansatz is essentially this. And you plug this simple ansatz into this uh, many electron Schrodinger equation and then solve it. And you will not go through the algebra here. This yields the standard hartree fock approximation, which you should have heard before. But I will give you an idea what you have to do. So this equation is the equation that pops up, so the kinetic energy operator. And now this guy, again, operates only on a single electron. This guy is an orbital, so it's a one electron wave function. It doesn't have all the many coordinates. It has a single coordinate only. This is the nuclear electron interaction. And this here is now an effective potential, and that's opposed to DFT. This potential is, in Hartree-Fock theory, a little bit different. And essentially, I will use diagrams uh, to represent this interaction. I will later come back to these diagrams and will try to explain how they come about. But the first term that comes up is actually sum over all particles j, from j is equal 1 to the number of electrons. And if you look at this, this is just uh, phi j. No, this is psi, right? Help me, psi, right? I'm really bad with this. So psi j, complex conjugated at the position x, psi j at the composition x prime. This is obviously charge density. And the charge density we can represent using gold tone diagrams uh, by a circle. And we'll explain a little bit more in detail later how this comes about. So this means here, actually, we 
we have an outgoing line which represents this orbital here, and we have an incoming line that represents this orbital, and this is nothing but the charge density at the position x prime. Then this here is the Coulomb operator indicated by the blue weekly line. And the Coulomb, inter, uh, Coulomb operator creates out of this density times r minus r prime, it creates the Coulomb potential. So it's exactly the electrostatic potential created by the electrons. So this guy here is this here. This here is the density of the closed circuit, and it creates the Coulomb potential. And then this Coulomb potential acts on another sum over states on the density created by the other electrons. So this is the operation of the effective potential onto an orbital at the position x. This is the first term. This is exactly the Hartree interaction. You will see or try to recall this diagram if you have never seen this. This is essentially the Hartree interaction. Maybe, maybe I will chop it down just that we don't forget this. Because we will come across this today and next time uh, is essentially the Hartree interaction. Now, the second term, and I will come again to this term and repeat it actually in the next lectures, is the exchange interaction. So here we have now, again, this orbital, but now at the position x prime, as well as the position x. And here, we have the same quantity represented by this green arrow. The difference before is now that we don't close it at this point, but we leave it open and contract it differently in space. Essentially, we connect this position to this orbital, and that position here to the other orbital. So we have this kind of diagram here. And here's again the Coulomb interaction, r minus r prime. This here is the exchange interaction. And as you know, this has no classical analog on in, the, uh, in electrostatics. So this is essentially the electrostatic interaction or Hartree interaction. This is the exchange interaction that is related to the antisymmetry of the main electron wave function. Ah, now it works. Hartree-Fock is a good theory. It's a quite simple theory. Uh, actually, this theory is variational because we've made a simple answer for the many electron wave function. And because it's variational, you kind of variationally optimize it. You get an upper bound for the true, co for the true energy of the many electron system. We've made a very simple answer for the many electron wave function. So it's for sure the case that this here is our Hartree-Fock energy. And it's necessarily about above the real ground state energy of the true many electron system. In DFT, we have a similar effective potential. Actually, the potential also contains the Hartree term. But this term here is usually not present, the second term, the exchange term. And it's local and replaced by function of the density only. This quantity here, the difference between the Hartree-Fock energy and the true ground state energy will be called correlation energy. The idea now in many body perturbation theories that we set out from this simple solution, from the Hartree-Fock solution, and, and go from the Hartree-Fock solution to the true many electron solution. So we start from the original Hartree-Fock orbitals and try to actually describe what happens if we switch on uh, the many electron Hamiltonian. So we try to, to see what happens if we start from the Hartree-Fock Hamiltonian and make perturbation theory to the true many electron Hamiltonian. And essentially, we switch from one guy to the other adiabatically slowly, by slowly switching it on. And we will try to actually determine what is the magnitude of the correlation energy if we slowly switch from the Hartree-Fock Hamiltonian to the true many electron Hamiltonian. Now, this method, you must think clearly, this method cannot work always either, right? This method will only work if there is some connection between the Hartree-Fock ground state and the true many electron ground state. So otherwise, perturbation theory might fail and diverge or yield unpredictable results. So there must be some way to switch from the Hartree-Fock to the true many electron uh, system, or these two must be in some way related. We will come back to this later. This, by the way, is usually the case if the system is weakly correlated. So these talks, all the talks I have, are really constrained to systems that are nowadays called intermediately correlated. This is not about uh, strongly correlated systems. So this class of perturbation series will always fail if you have a strongly correlated many electron system. So then you have to apply methods like dynamic mean field theory or DMRG density matrix renormalization group theory. 
In quantum chemistry, you then have to use multi-reference methods. And essentially, the difference is in quantum chemistry that you don't start from a single Hartree-Fock determinant, from, but from multiple Hartree-Fock determinants, and then try to do something like perturbation theory, which turns out to be really, really difficult to do in practice. So how do quantum chemists approach the problem? I told you before, what you do first is you calculate the Hartree-Fock ground state. And later, we'll come back to this. You can also use the Cohn-Sham ground state for, pet, for the starting point of your perturbation theory. So you calculate the Hartree-Fock ground state. And this diagram is, is very easy to understand. So essentially, what you have here are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 states. You have 8 electrons. So you occupy, you put your electrons in the ground state into these lowest lying orbitals of the Hartree-Fock Hamiltonian. And the residual orbitals, the other ones, are essentially empty to start with. It's eight electrons. These are the Hartree-Fock orbitals, the lowest Hartree-Fock orbitals. In many cases, if you do two systems, you have a band gap between this here and that state. So there's truly, most cases, a band gap. So if you do a molecule, but even if you do a solid, there is a true band gap. And now I can say a little bit more about this perturbation theory. Actually, this perturbation theory usually works if there is a band gap setting out from the Hartree-Fock Hamiltonian, moving to the two many electron Hamiltonian. If this band pre prevails throughout the description, then usually the many body perturbation theory works. So in many perturbation theory, what you now do is you actually expand your solution into the ground state Hartree-Fock determinant. I call it ground state. It's not the two many electron ground state. It's the Hartree-Fock determinant. This is your psi. Now, what's this symbol? Phi. <laughs> Thank you. Phi zero. And actually, my, my slides are not entirely consistent. So I, I switched from phi to psi in several places, unfortunately. I realized that too late. And since uh, uh, Felix Hummel did many of the slides, he used an inconsistent notation. So this is the, yeah, I, well, I had different notation than him. So and it was too late to change it, yeah? And he didn't want to, to be honest, OK? <laughs> It's not just you need to be more flexible, OK? So this is our phi 0. This is our, this is our single slater determinant where we have put the electrons into these occupied orbitals, and these are unoccupied. Now, in quantum chemistry, but also in quantum field theory, what you do is you expand the true solution, the true many electron wave function, into single excitations. And you probably have seen this, maybe, this slide maybe also in the talk of Ali Alavi. This is, by the way, my slide originally. <laughs> So you expand it into single excitations. And what does it mean? It means that you remove an electron from this orbital and place the electron into the orbital, into a previously unoccupied orbital. So you remove an electron, kick it out here, and move it up into this previously unoccupied orbital. This is the single excitation. Here is a double excitation, where you actually take out two electrons from the ground state and put it into these orbitals A and B. In perturbation theory, what you then need to do is you just need to determine these coefficients here in front of these single excited states, double excited states, triple excited states, and so on and so on. Here we have eight electrons, so you can have actually up to eight excitations from the ground state orbitals into previously unoccupied orbitals. That's the maximum you can have. Actually, does this help us? This expansion of the many electron wave function in principle is as complicated as our original problem. We haven't gained a lot. We have just rephrased the problem a little bit. Does this still work? Yeah. So we have just rephrased the problem a little bit. What we have done is we now start from a Hartree-Fock determinant and apply a perturbation theory essentially to determine those coefficients. Just a little bit of a rephrasing, because the point here is how many coefficients will we need to use well, it turns out the number of coefficients is gigantic. Actually, the number of coefficients, if we have 32 of these orbitals, and if we have only eight electrons, even then it's almost unsolvable. Because the number of coefficients we will have is 32 over 8. That's 10 to the 26. This didn't help us at all. Previously, we had like 10,000 terabytes. This is even larger in practice. So we haven't really gained a lot. Well, we are now with eight electrons and no longer with five electrons. But this is, we are still having this exponential or rather combinatorial wall that we had already originally. But the trick now is maybe we can determine these coefficients using some clever perturbation theory and truncate the perturbation theory at some finite order. If we can achieve that, 
and have a computationally feasible scheme. I don't care, by the way, about schemes that are not implementable on a computer. A scheme that I like needs to be implementable on a computer and needs to run reasonably fast so that we can do true modeling of materials. So if we can determine those coefficients kind of perturbationally, we are kind of done, that might be feasible to implement on a computer program. OK, how does one do this perturbation theory? There are infinite many papers on this, probably. And in the 30s, 50s, well, between the 30s and the 50s, there have been many different ways to phrase this perturbation theory. It's always about the same. It's always about how you determine those coefficients. Yeah? This is essentially the point. But there are many different ways to derive the equations. And from my point of view, the most elegant one is via second quantization, gelman low theorem, Wick theorem, and the link cluster theorem. These are essentially the four theorems that you need for a very compact way to write down this perturbation theory. Again, my, in my, from my point of view, these are the very basics. If you have got those basics, you can move on to strong correlation. But first, you need to completely be firm with what you do in these four theorems. Again, I mean, this will be very tough because I have only one hour left. Uh, maybe I will take 10 minutes more. Yeah, I will try. So let's talk about second quantization. And I've heard you have already had some talks about it, some introductions to it. I anyway want to give for those few that have not heard about second quantization, give you an idea what it does. Second quantization is not something new. It's just a clever way to introduce an algebra to solve the many electron Schrodinger equation. So it's nothing, there's nothing new in second quantization. It's just a clever rephrasement of the many body wave function, of the many body Schrodinger equation. So essentially, it's, a, it's just a clever algebra to solve this equation here. Yeah? I don't know why this. Can anyone explain to me who is wiser than I? Why is it called second quantization? Anyone has a clue? Yes? 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 Yes. That kind of makes sense, but anyway, it's still the same quantization. I thought actually it's a quantization of fields. Yeah, OK. I will not answer the question now. Anyway, it's not relevant. It's nothing new. So we have the many electron Schrodinger equation. All we want to do is to solve it. And that's why we introduced this algebra. And the algebra is nice because it captures all the intricacies, all the complications of fermions in it. So it embodies all the complications of fermionic properties of fermionic guys. So uh, I will introduce this in a quite, I will try to introduce it in a quite simply, simplistic way, OK? So we, we actually introduce, in this Fox space, so in this particular space, we introduce operators. And we introduce the operator C plus K. And this operator essentially creates an electron in one of those orbitals. So it essentially creates an operator in the hartree fox space and puts an electron in one of these orbitals. For the time being, I don't make a difference between the originally unoccupied orbitals and the originally occupied orbitals. I just write k as a kind of general index. Yeah? So this can be either occupied or unoccupied. So this creation operator, if you apply this creation operator to the so-called vacuum state, this is a state that doesn't have any electrons yet, you create an orbital in the state k. This here is essentially the Slater determinant. So this uh, sign here is essentially calculating the determinant. So this operator, C dagger k, creates an electron in the orbital, in the single electron orbital k. Now imagine that we create a second orbital, or create a second electron in an orbital j. So it's C dagger j. In this case, we create. We add, actually, to the Slater determinant to the very left another orbital at the position x1 and x2. So we add to the left and down here, essentially, a second state. So this is one electron state, one electron Slater determinant. This is a two electron Slater determinant. And we can do that repeatedly. So we can add another electron, Ci plus, and this will create another column in our Slater determinant. So. Another rule we have is acting. So this is essentially a rule how to apply uh, the creation operator. It's a strict rule. It tells you what to do 
in terms of the Slater determinant when you add an electron. Another rule is that when you act twice with the creation operator on the same orbital, so C dagger J, C dagger J, so we, if we create two electrons in one particular state, it will yield zero. Makes sense because these are fermions, so we can't have two electrons in one orbital, right? So D, C dagger J, C dagger J, that means going back here, we create an orbital in A, and then we try to create another electron in this, and this is not allowed by fermions rule. So this is just a mathematical rule if we apply this creation operator twice, onto the ground state orbital, we get always zero. This takes care that we do not generate two particles in one orbital. Another thing, and that follows from the algebra of uh, determinants and Slater determinants, is that changing the order changes the sign. If you change J, move J here, and I, you move the I over there, and write down your Slater determinant, you will see that it has exactly the opposite sign than the original Slater determinant. You can see this already up here. If you exchange J and K, so if you move K over here and J over there and write down your Slater determinant, and you only need rules for determinants, you see it will change sign. What does that mean? That means that actually uh, our operators have to observe this rule. C plus J, Ci plus, so this creates an orbital in J and this creates an orbital in I, is the same as first creating the orbital in I and then the orbital in J. So this follows again simply from the rules of uh, Slater determinants and has nothing really particular sophisticated about it. Anyway, we already see here that we are dealing, for all these people who know this very well from quantum many body theory, we see immediately that this actually embeds essentially the typical rules for fermions. So how do we introduce the annihilation operator the annihilation operator removes the leftmost state from the Slater determinant. So if you actually use this operator, Cj, it actually takes an electron out from the orbital J and just removes it. Let's imagine you want to apply this to this Slater determinant, then before you're allowed to remove the electrons, you have to swap the columns here, and swapping the columns changes the sign. So you bring that to the front, and this later determinant has, has the opposite sign of this guy here, and this guy then destroys this column and collapses this to a two by two determinant. So if required, the columns need to be brought to the leftmost side and the sign needs to be changed accordingly. So this follows from the rule that uh, swapping, swapping two columns in this later determinant changes its sign. We just had this on the previous slide. So again, interchanging the order of the annihilation operators changes the sign. So, and that uh, allows us, if we take the two previous slides and walk through them, we come up with this well-known algebra for fermions, well-known algebra for creation and annihilation operators. So this here, C dagger Q, anti-commutes with C dagger P. In other words, C dagger P, C dagger Q plus anti-commutation operator, C dagger Q, C dagger P is equal zero. This operation also, this also applies to the, anti, uh, to the uh, annihilation operators, and the most important rule is this one. If you first destroy an electron and then create an electron in the orbital P, it observes this particular algebra here. And that's very well known. All this is nothing but the usual algebra that you have in many body language for the creation and annihilation operators of a fermion electronic system. Again, all that follows from the basic rules of Slater determinants and from my original introduction of the Slater determinants, how they work in the Slater determinantal space. So these rules, these very compact rules, are strictly following from everything I had on my previous slides. You can do it. If you haven't ever done it, you should do it yourself at home and figure out that this is indeed true. So in classical many-body physics, your ground state is usually described by the vacuum ground state. So in quantum field theory, for classical fields, you usually act with all your operators on the vacuum state. And in many-body perturbation theory for solids, 
there is one, one small difference that we set out from the original artifact determinant. So our ground state is not the vacuum ground state with zero electrons, but our ground state originally has already n electrons in the lowest occupied orbitals. OK. Yes. So our ground state, we replace the vacuum ground state that you have in usual many-body perturbation theory, or it's often written like that or like that. We, re we, we replace that by the Hartree-Fock determinant. That makes actually things slightly more difficult. Up to this point, I've talked about these creation operators, C dagger A and C dagger I. And now we create a new set, or we introduce a new set of creation and annihilation operators that are closely linked to these original operators, but they are slightly different, subtly different. So for the unoccupied states, for the originally unoccupied states, I will from now use on the index A, and I will write this on 10 on the blackboard because it's an important thing always to keep in your mind. And you might have seen this in the talks of Ali Alavi, for instance. A means always an originally unoccupied state. This is a convention from quantum chemistry. And I, let's be more precise, A, B, C, I, J, K, is an originally occupied state. So now, for the unoccupied states, for those states that were originally unoccupied, we introduce or we leave the creation and annihilation operators as they were originally. So we define new operators, A and A dagger, that are exactly equivalent to original operators, C dagger A and C A. But for the previously occupied state, we swap them. We interchange the creation and annihilation operators. So we actually introduce I as an annihilation operator. So we define I as CI dagger, and we define I dagger as CI. Now this is a little bit strange, and you will, oops, finish. Yeah, this is usually what happens to me, so I just hit the wrong key, go to the bottom of the presentation. You see, I'm already getting tired. So let's look at this, why do we do that? So for the previously unoccupied states, our creation operator remains as it is. So A dagger means create an additional electron in the previously unoccupied state. But I dagger, I dagger actually is the same as CI. So it actually creates a hole. So it takes out an electron from the system. So CI, that's the annihilation operator. And I dagger then is nothing but a hole creation operator. So I dagger creates a hole. CI creates a hole, right? So it's the annihilation operator. And I dagger is actually now identified to be the hole creation operator. And that makes a lot of sense. And from now on, we have to be extremely careful. And on purpose, I use two different operators. I use either CI plus which creates an electron in a previous occupied state, or I plus, and I plus creates a hole. And that makes a lot of sense because we set out from a Slater determinant where we have occupied a certain number of orbitals. We have setting out from the Hartree-Fock determinant where these states are originally unoccupied. So our creation operators will create a hole in this subspace. That's a sensible definition. So I plus creates essentially a hole. A plus creates essentially a particle. So let me write this down here. So I plus creates a hole in the occupied manifold. And it's therefore equal to CI and A plus creates an electron in the unoccupied space, manifold. So 
this is C A plus. This is a useful convention and you should apply it for quantum chemistry. You should also apply it if you deal with solid state systems. So this slide really summarizes everything we had up to this point. It kind of, yeah? Yes. Well, we, we deal, I mean, in classical quantum antibody theory, you deal with the vacuum state. So you deal with fluctuations in the vacuum state. Here we have a, a certain number of electrons, let's say eight electrons in our systems. And so it's useful, more useful to deal with a system where we occupy initially, so this is our ground state, the orbitals, the lowest eight orbitals by electrons and leave the other ones unoccupied. That's our reference ground state, yes? It makes the algebra far more compact. And it's also, I mean, the difference, again, the difference is that in classical quantum field theory, for fields, you start from a vacuum ground state. Here, our ground state, our original ground state, is the ground state of an n-electron system, the Hartree-Fock ground state of an n-electron system. So our perturbation theory, and that's what we've written down here, sets out from the Hartree-Fock ground state, where you have eight electrons, yeah? originally already in your system. This is different from quantum field theory, classical field theory for fields, yeah? Where you have really the vacuum state and want to calculate the fluctuation. Here you have really eight electrons to set out. So your ground state, your, I shouldn't say ground state, your zero order ground state, okay, is a state where you have eight electrons that occupy the lowest orbital. And then how you change that? Well, by introducing this creation operator, that creation operator now needs to annihilate an electron here, yeah? So it takes out an electron, I plus takes out an electron out of this orbital. That's a useful thing to do, and that's therefore the whole creation operator. So this operator, I plus, creates a hole in the originally occupied, in the zero order ground state occupied manifold. This creation operator creates an electron in the originally unoccupied manifold. So there we leave it as it used to be, and for the unoccupied we change it. Okay? Makes sense, right? But it's a good, no, it's a good question. And that's why probably I cannot explain it in, in one and a half hour. Actually, Nicola asked me whether I want to talk uh, four times one and a half hour. And, and originally, I thought it's impossible to fill so many lectures. And now I'm, I think it was a mistake. I should have said more hours. Now, this is really important. I mean, this is really important to understand. This is our ground state in classical quantum field theory. There would be all black bars. Yeah, no electrons in originally. Here the difference is that we set out from this state here where we have eight electrons already in the system to start with. And then we introduce, we kind of have this identification, and I plus then means create a hole here because it annihilates an electron in the ground, in the heart of ground state. Yeah? So here are the anti-commutator relations, and this one I could write down both for I as well as for uh, J and A. So the anti-commutator relation A, B is zero. A plus B plus is zero. And A plus B is equal to delta A, B. So again, all these, all these operators do is to embed all the intricacies of fermions. So we have taken care of, of all the complications of fermions. For instance, these rules mean if we apply the creation operators twice to the same orbital, if we apply the creation operators twice to the same orbital, we get zero. What I've written down here. C plus a creation operator on the orbital, on the same orbital, in succession, is zero. So using the creation operator twice on the same orbital gives zero. That makes sense. You cannot have two electrons in one orbital. Using the annihilation operator twice on the same orbital yields zero. There are very few cases that yield anything. And the only case that yields anything is this one here. So you first annihilate an electron and then create one. That's delta AB. That's one of the few cases that can yield something and only if those two operators operate on the same orbital. So what? can we do with these operators? Well, now we can rewrite the original Hartree-Fock Hamiltonian 
the original many electron Hamiltonian I had before, we can now rewrite using those operators. That's the trick. So we, re we re essentially rewrite the previous many body Schrodinger equation, and we will use those operators. And here are some operators that are useful. This operator annihilates an electron in the orbital p and then puts it back in. So this annihilates an electron and then puts it back in. When will this yield any values? Look at this here. When will it yield values? Well, it will yield a value if you first create a hole here and then put back the electron into the same place, right? It will yield no value, zero essentially, if you apply it to unoccupied state. So this operator is kind of a counting. It's an operator that allows you to count the electrons, right? So it will only yield a value if this orbital was already occupied originally. And then you put back in the orbital so you don't do anything to your state. So it's essentially kind of does nothing. But if there was already an electron, it will take it out and then put it back in. If this is used for a previously unoccupied orbital, you will get the vacuum state. So if you, if you operate with this operator onto a previously unoccupied orbital, you will get the vacuum state zero. You will get not the vacuum state. Sorry, I correct myself. You will get zero. Yeah. So this is a useful operator. It just counts the number of electrons in the orbital p. Yeah. It determines the number of electrons in the orbital p. So actually, from this, we can immediately construct an operator that counts the total number of electrons. This is this operator. We simply sum over all orbitals. Yeah? So this is essentially something like a density operator. It determines the number of electrons in a particular orbital p. So it's something like a density operator. And this here is the density matrix operator, actually. This creates. This creates a hole in orbital p, or takes out an electron of orbital p, annihilation operator for orbital p. And this is a creation operator in orbital q. And this is called the excitation operator, or the density matrix operator. It essentially allows you to calculate the density matrix between two orbitals p and q. If you have the density matrix, you can actually translate potentials, local potentials, or non-local potentials into the correct equation that you would use in second quantization. So a one electron operator can be also re always written as the potential expressed in this, in this basis. So we have orbitals y p. No, you can't move this up. Hmm. So you have actually an v. And what I write down here is VQP is equal to Q. This here is a one electron operator that has a single coordinate. And this VQP is nothing but essentially the original operator in this particular basis of orbitals. These here are the one electron orbitals from Hartley Fock. And all you need to do is you need to evaluate these one electron orbitals in this particular basis and multiply it with the corresponding density operator. So this is a means to convert a one electron operator into this language of second quantization. This will very quick again. For instance, for a local potential, just if you look at this, you can actually rewrite this guy here by basis set transformation into the local potential times the density at the particular state point, or the number density operator at the particular state point. This is just the basis set transformation. If you set out from here to a basis set transformation, then for a local potential, this becomes essentially this equation. So this is just V at the position R, the potential at the position R times the expectation value for the number of electrons at this position. So. What about the two electron operator in our many electron Schrodinger equation? There's only one two electron operator. That's the interaction term between two electrons, one over r minus r prime, the Coulomb operator. This is essentially this guy. This is an operator that involves de two densities at two space points, yes? It, it, it gives the interaction energy between two electrons. And for this purpose, we need the two particle density matrix, which analogous to the previous slide, 
the one particle density matrix can be written like this. So this creates a whole or annihilates an electron in state S, annihilates an electron in state R, and then puts back in electrons in state P, P, and this should be another mistake on my side, a creation on the orbital Q. This one I can correct on the fly, because this one I have written. Well, analogous to the one particle density matrix, this operator is used for the two particle density matrix. And this here is now the Coulomb potential in this particular basis. I will give you an, a definition of this in a minute here on the blackboard, but this is exactly the Coulomb operator in this basis of the RT4 orbitals. And this here measures kind of how likely it is to find an electron in orbital S and R. And then you put in the orbitals back into the orbitals P and Q. Well, to give you some feeling what it is, I've, I've run through the algebra here. So you, this here is essentially the many electron wave function. Here you put in your operators, your two particle density matrix operators. Then you can commute those two using the rules we have had before, the anti commutation rules. So you exchange those two here. That changes the sign here. And then this here comes from this delta function we had before. So all I have done here to go from the left to the right is inserting the basic matrix algebra I've introduced before, that the anti-commutation operator between two such states is delta IB, or respectively, I did already on this slide, I've only used essentially this equation to convert this guy here into that here. And the second step is, that I identify, I do a basis set transformation from this hartree fock basis to the real space basis. And here I do the same thing. This is exactly the same operator we had before. This is the particle number operator at two different positions. And essentially, if you now do a basis set transformation of this guy and this guy and go to the real space basis, just a basis set transformation. I can't do this here on the blackboard. It takes probably half an hour to do, well, it takes 20 minutes to do it properly. If you do a basis set transformation, you can believe me that this essentially comes up here. And the same thing you do here. This is now real space. So we go from the orbitals to the real space representation. And then you see immediately what this describes. This here measures the density at the position R prime. And this here, the second operator, measures the density at the position R. And this here is the Coulomb interaction. So this is our original term in the many-body Hamiltonian. And this is our rewrite in the language of second quantization. So no miraculous things have gone on. All we have done, we have rewritten our original equations that we had in the Schrodinger picture into the language of second quantization. Density operator is equal annihilation operator, iteration operator at R prime. Here's another density operator which is essentially the complex conjugate of the first, but at the position R. Then you do a basis set transformation, you come back to these particular operators. So, this essentially allows us now to rewrite our original Schrodinger equation into the language of second quantization. This was kind of the first part of the lecture, and it has taken me one hour, and it should have taken 10 minutes. <laughs> Not quite so bad. So this is our original many-body Schrodinger equation. And essentially, here is a rewrite of our many-body Schrodinger equation in the language of second quantization. For all of those that have already seen this many times, there's no, nothing special about this. We have essentially only rewritten this. So let's look at the individual terms. This is our original unperturbed Hamiltonian, kinetic energy, nuclear electron interaction and some effective potential. And this term can be written in this form here. Annihilation operator in orbital P and putting back the electron into orbital P. And this is the eigenenergy in the one electron basis. These are essentially our hard to fog one electron energies. This here is essentially our unperturbed hard to fog Hamiltonian. And the rest, is our perturbation. And our perturbation describes the move 
from the exact many electron Hamiltonian, this is this term here. This here is our Hartree-Fock Hamiltonian, so we switch off the Hartree-Fock Hamiltonian and switch on the exact many body electron Hamiltonian. So this is our Ampitoic Hamiltonian, this is the Hartree-Fock Hamiltonian, and now in many body perturbation series, we switch from the Hartree-Fock Hamiltonian to the exact many body Hamiltonian. And this can be written as in second quantization, we have essentially only the electron electron interaction, which is written down here. This here essentially measures kind of the number of holes at one place, and this is measuring the number of electrons at another place. And this here is the effective interaction. The one electron potential that we switch off. It's the term I've talked about before, or on the two slides that were presented here. So Usually, one chooses the reference Hamiltonian to be diagonal in its own eigenfunctions. What does that mean? We usually set out from the Hartree-Fock Hamiltonian, and the orbitals we choose for the second quantization, at least in quantum chemistry, are the orbitals that diagonalize the Hartree-Fock Hamiltonian. So usually, the reference is Hartree-Fock, but as you will see later, we can also use DFT. So now. The rest I have to do probably quite quickly. But these are pretty standard procedures. Uh, essentially, we now have to, what we have now ticked is actually second quantization. I will briefly now touch on Gelman law theorem, then have the Rick theorem. and then the link cluster theorem. So we have essentially done the first part, and we have still three things to do. Gelman law theorem. Yes, I'm getting desperate. <laughs> and you probably getting more desperate, I guess, because this is really complicated. And you realize that only when you start talking about it, you can look at your slides and you don't have a clue how it will work when you present it. So, this is not so difficult. Actually, what we will do now is we will switch. We will switch now from this unperturbed Hartree-Fock Hamiltonian to the many body. So this is a point for those people that have stopped thinking. This is maybe a point to try to come back. Okay? <laughs> yes. Okay. Everyone has stopped thinking. <laughs> so we now switch from the from the uh, from the Hartree-Fock Hamiltonian to the exact many body Hamiltonian. The other thing to consider here that we are working in the language of second quantization. So our Hartree-Fock Hamiltonian, we use Hartree-Fock orbitals to diagonalize the Hartree-Fock orbital. In second quantization, this looks like this. And this you have seen, I'm sure, in other talks here. right? And this here is the electron, electron interaction. So if you haven't understand the steps, how we got there, don't worry. You can just accept it, that this is our Hamiltonian in second quantization. This here switches on the electron electron interaction. And this here actually switches off the Hartree-Fock Hamiltonian. So it switches on the potential energy terms in the Hartree-Fock Hamiltonian. It switches off the Hartree-Fock, so both the Hartree potential as well as the Fock potential. And we switch on instead the exact many body Hamiltonian. So this is pretty standard. Uh, actually, we now make a few tricks. This is our perturbation, H1. And what we first do is we go to the interaction picture for time-dependent perturbation theory. Essentially, we rephrase our operator, our time-independent operator, as a time-dependent operator. So H1 is, in principle, non-time-dependent perturbation. right? And we introduce here time-dependent perturbation theory. The time is only here to switch. Later, the time will be only used to switch from the, uh, from the, from the unperturbed Hamiltonian to the perturbed Hamiltonian. The interaction picture implies that we actually, uh, in the interaction picture, define actually the interacting Hamiltonian as e to the power of i h zero t times the perturbation. And here we multiply with the complex conjugated. Then states involve according to this Schrodinger, slightly modified Schrodinger equation, I d psi dt 
of our interaction picture is given by this Hamiltonian here in the interaction picture times this uh, time dependent state. First step is to derive a time evolution operator that describes how a state at time t0 involves to a state at time t. This is our time evolution operator, and you can obtain the time evolution operator by essentially plugging those definitions into the many body Schrödinger equation and running through the derivation. The time evolution operator will allow us to propagate the state at time t0 to a state at time t quite elegant compact notation. And here is our final result. And this looks very much a little bit like a Dyson equation. Well, not quite. So we have here the time evolution operator is 1 minus i times our Hamiltonian in the inter inter interaction picture times, and that's our problem. It's obviously recursively defined because this time evolution operator comes up in here again. Again, this is pretty straightforward. It's basic mass. You can do it in a few lines. You just insert the defining equations into this, uh, into the many electron Schrodinger equation to actually derive the time evolution operator. Okay, this is obviously not a closed solution. To obtain a closed solution, you essentially start here with the delta function and obtain the first order term and here then higher order terms uh, are obtained from this equation. Essentially, you start with ui is equal to 1. So you throw away this term here to obtain 1 here. So then you insert the 1 here. And then you iterate this equation to obtain a closed equation for the time evolution operator. The good news is, essentially, here in this lecture, I will not go beyond this first order term. So I will never actually, I will only use essentially those two terms here in the time evolution operator. And this is pretty much standard, so it's 1 minus i. And then the integral from t0, this is the starting time, to the final time t times the Hamiltonian in the interaction picture at time t prime. Essentially, I will use only this here. And the Gelman law idea was now to slowly switch on this perturbation. So we actually switch from the original Hartree-Fock Hamiltonian to the many-body electron Hamiltonian. This is here again. We switch from Hartree-Fock to the many-body Hamiltonian by slowly switching on our perturbation. So we multiply this time-dependent Hamiltonian in the action picture by a kind of damping term. Now let's look if uh, actually tau, this, sorry, this is eta, right? Again, weakness in this friction was actually I'm choking a little bit, actually. I know it. If I concentrate, I know it. But if I give a talk, I always forget it. So eta is larger than 0. That means if you evaluate this quantity here, tau, at the time t minus infinity, eta is positive. If you evaluate this at minus infinity, it's obviously 0, right? So at t minus infinity, we have 0 here. We have no perturbation. And we essentially slowly, slowly switch on this perturbation. And the t is equal to 0, eta times 0. This is essentially 1. At t is equal to 0, we have then actually our exact many-body Hamiltonian. So we switch from the artifact Hamiltonian slowly, 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 adiabatically to the many-electron Hamiltonian. OK, well, then essentially, <coughs> Our many electron wave function is given as the time evolution operator from minus infinity. This is the starting point of our perturbation. This is the end point where we have the full many body Hamiltonian. So, this is our time evolution operator that propagates states from minus infinity to time zero. If our perturbation series converge, and then we can actually write our many body wave function. As this time evolution operator from minus infinity, where we have the Hartree-Fock Hamiltonian, times times this Hartree-Fock wave function. So this is the one single slater determinant. This is the one determinant that has only a single slater determinant. This is our starting point. This is the Hartree-Fock Hamiltonian. We switch adiabatically from this Hartree-Fock wave function to the true many-body wave function. Yeah. And all we need to do then is to propagate our Hartree-Fock wave function using the time evolution operator to the many-body wave function. 
That's nice because we have already a closed expression for our time evolution operator worked out. So essentially, if we truncate it at second order, this is our time evolution operator. So we have that. And we have a means to propagate our Hartley Fock wave function to the true many body wave function. So we only plug this guy here in from the previous slide. As simple as that. So we plug this guy in here, and we are done. OK, can we evaluate the ground state energy of the many body system? The ground state energy we now assume at t is equal to 0. Our Hamiltonian is given by the initial Hartley Fock Hamiltonian plus the many body Hamiltonian. Essentially, this sum here is, again, our true many body Hamiltonian. This is essentially done here. So we have our true many body Hamiltonian. H0 is our Hartley Fock, and this is uh, many body minus Hartley Fock potential terms. And if we are lucky, and this adiabatic switching works, if the perturbation theory converges, we can write actually this expectation value should be equal E0 plus some term delta E times the many body wave function. So if the perturbation theory works, this is our true many body wave function. This guy is our true many body wave function, and we can insert in. So it really solves this is our true many body Hamiltonian. This is truly an eigenstate of this true many body wave function. So we plug that in, and that will give us some energy E0. This is the Hartley Fock energy plus a correction term. This is this correlation energy. So by means of this, this is our E0, our Hartley Fock energy. By means of this, we obtain here the two many body energy. Uh, well, this looks a little bit ugly still. We cannot use that in practice. And that's why we multiply from the left side with the Hartley Fock wave function. So all we do is we multiply from the left side with the Hartley Fock wave function. So you multiply this guy from the left with the Hartley Fock wave function. You multiply this guy from the left with the Hartley Fock wave function. They will kill me if I touch this, right? I make probably ugly blotches on the whiteboard, right? OK, so we multiply from the left with the Hartley Fock wave function. And obviously, this yields, and no one should do this on the blackboard. We get, we then bring this on the other side and divide through. So this is basic algebra. So you multiply from the left with this guy, and then divide by. I uh, should do it. It's so primitive. And then you come up with these equations here. So this here is multiply from the left with the vacuum ground state. This gives this term here. This gives that term here. And then we divide by E0 plus delta. Then we divide by uh, the Hartree Fock terms, the many electron wave function, divide by this to come up with this equation. It's very basic algebra. So this is our, our correlate. This is essentially the true ground state energy of the many electron wave function. And now the only thing we have to do is for this guy, this is the many electron wave function, we insert the Hartree Fock wave function times the time propagation operator from minus infinity to zero. So this is the true many body wave function. And we just plug that in, and we are done. And we have now, for the first time, a compact equation for the total correlation energy. And all it involves are Hartree Fock ground state wave functions, time evolution operators, and the unperturbed Hamiltonian, as well as the perturbation, as simple as this. So this is, again, exactly the same equation copied from the previous slide. We have now an equation that gives you the Hartree Fock energy plus the correlation energy, which is the true many body energy, and it's given by this compact equation. The only catch to this is that we have still an infinite sum in this time evolution operator. And in perturbation theory, we now go order by order through these terms. The other thing I want to mention, all operators are in the interaction picture. But from now on, I will remove the i here. So it's implicitly assumed that all of the operators we have here are in the interaction picture. So this is, in principle, nice, because in, we have a really nice compact equation for the correlation energy. However, we still need a, red, a, a vest, well, actually, even better, these are really vacuum expect these are really ground state expectation values. These are the Hartree Fock wave functions. So this really, everything is in principle known. We only need now a recipe to calculate vacuum expectation values, because these guys here are the Hartree Fock determinant. In many body perturbation theory, traditionally, this would be the vacuum ground state, right? 
I've told you before we have actually chosen a different ground state, namely this ground state where we had previously initially occupied eight states. It's the only difference, but this is equivalent to the vacuum ground state of many body perturbation theory. So we need a recipe to calculate these vacuum expectation values. And that's where the second theory comes in. So this was okay. The Gelman Low theorem worked pretty, pretty fast. So let's look at the Wick theorem. The Wick theorem is, is actually the backbone of all this. Who knows the Wick theorem? Excellent. No, it's not great because actually, again, who knows the Wick theorem? Who has never actually studied this? Now, come on, this can't be. No, 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 no. Now we, this, I don't, the, who knows the Wick theorem? Who has heard about it but doesn't know it? And who doesn't know it? The sum is not the audience. <laughs> don't feel embarrassed. OK, here is something embarrassing. I had no clue about the Wick theorem 10 years ago. And then I was already full professor. OK? This is not embarrassing to know nothing about Wick theorem because in many, in many classes, this is no longer taught. Yeah? Many body perturbation series slip from the radar. OK, now I, I, I need to entertain you a little, at least a little bit, right? This series come up, came up in the 50s, so they are done, right? So they are kind of totally boring. They are totally, actually, they were considered even be largely useless, yeah? because you can't use them for evaluating real properties, right? So that's why they dropped from even teaching radars. But these are extremely compact theories. Of course, I can't teach it in one and a half hour. That's ridiculous. You need a complete course to teach them. You need something like 10 hours, I guess, yeah, to really teach them thoroughly. But people don't do it anymore because it's not relevant, right? But that's not true because the, the big point is now we can do them in solid states. We can apply these theories for the first time to solid state systems. Unfortunately, the paper that you might read they don't mention these theorems anymore. They might cumbersomely rewrite the formula somehow. And I will do that later, actually. Don't worry. I will come back to very simple things later in my other two lectures. I will not involve anything that is coming up here. But we can do it. Only the papers in the 70s and 18s assumed that everyone knew the Wick theorem. And then they are very compact and they write some equations down. And most people use then these theories written down in the 70s, like Hedin's equation. And they have kind of forgotten the basics. Yeah, so they're using Hedin's equations. They're using even very sophisticated uh, matrix renormalization group theory. And all that rests on people that, of course, knew the theorem and assumed that everyone knows it. Now we are in a new generation that doesn't learn the theories anymore. Wick theorem, all this perturbation theory is gone. They only learn this more sophisticated theories. But that's a tragedy, because you have no clue what you're talking about, OK? Because your basic is not there. So you have to learn this. I think there is absolutely no way out. But you have to learn this basic series before you jump into something more sophisticated. You have, his, you have seen full CI QMC. The basis of that is, of course, second quantization. You, I've seen you have talks about DMRG. Yeah? But you cannot understand those if you don't know what actually the theorem is. At least that's my feeling. OK. Now, what does Wick theorem? Wick theorem is actually, now I've forgotten it actually. <laughs> it's dreadful. Uh, Wick theorem is a very powerful algebraic theorem. There's really, again, nothing too fancy about it once you understand it. Actually, it reorders the operators. And now be careful. This Wick theorem, the way I apply it here in Hartree Fock, is that this applies to these operators here. Yeah? to the operators that create a hole or an electron. Yeah? So my normal ordering operators work on the level not of these operators, of these fundamental creation and annihilation operators, but on the level of these guys here yeah? that create a hole, respectively an electron. And the, I define the normal ordering to be that order that puts the annihilation operator first, and then the creation operator. So normal ordering is nothing but to place the normal order of two operators is exactly given by placing the annihilation operators to the right and the creation operators to the left. Why do we do this? What happens if you apply this operator to the ground state? 
Okay, think about it. What happens if we apply this operator to the ground state wave function, to our Hartree Fock wave function? Okay, we will, we will do this just for fun. So what happens if we apply the operator I or the operator A to the ground state Hartree Fock Hamiltonian? Let's go back to our slide that I had a few slides before. So what happens if we apply an annihilation operator? Let's do this first. And this A is equal to annihilation operator. So essentially, it takes out an electron of a previously unoccupied state. It removes an electron from a previously unoccupied state. So what happens if we apply this operator to the vacuum state? So if we apply this operator, and I really need more blackboard here. Yeah. So what happens if we apply the annihilation operator A to our Hartree Fock determinant? So if we apply, this is our Hartree Fock determinant, this is our vacuum ground state, our redefined vacuum ground state. If we apply an annihilation operator for a previously unoccupied orbital, what happens? It's zero. What happens if we apply this operator here to the ground state? So and I now, I is now equal C I C I plus. That was the definition, and that's why I introduced this. Maybe this answer is now better answered why we redefined our operators. Right? Somebody asked me why do I redefine the operators? Here it is. I creates a hole, or actually it annihilates a hole. It's equal C I plus. C I plus, but these orbitals are occupied in the ground state, in the Hartree Fock determinant. So C I plus actually creates also a zero if you apply it to the ground state. So that's why this normal order is so super useful, because by normal ordering all the operators, if you normal order the operators, you get something. If you actually apply it to the vacuum state, you will get always zero. Or if you apply it to the Hartree Fock ground state, you will get always exactly zero. That's why we introduced normal ordering. That's also why we actually rearranged and redefined our operators compared to those that are classically used in quantum field theory. So the normal order is the one where we have these i or a guys to the left and the i or a dagger, sorry, we have the i or a to the right and the i or a dagger to the, to the left. Well, because we are dealing with fermions, uh, the normal ordering also has to count the number of permutations that we need to do this normal order. And the sign is having actually given by the number of required permutations, p, and it is just minus 1 to the power of p. So the great thing about this is the vacuum expectation value of a normal operator always vanishes. This is what I have just gone through here. So the great thing is the vacuum expectation of any normal order operator vanishes. So if we order the operator normal, then the vacuum expectation value vanishes. This makes life reasonably easy and is exceedingly helpful. Unfortunately, we are not even close yet. The second thing to define is, is a con well, you see there are a lot of steps in these derivations. And if you haven't heard this before, it's really going to be a little bit difficult. I'm repeating myself, I know. The second step is that we define something that is called a contraction. The contraction is strictly defined as the difference between the original order of the operators in any arbitrary sequence minus the normal operator, normal ordered operators. It turns out, and this is very easy to follow if you, if you just play with the math, the contraction is always a scalar, and even nicer, very often it's zero. It turns out to be zero. So, for instance, the contraction, and this is, you just have to use the basic definitions, the contraction of two annihilation operators is always zero. The contraction of two creation operators is always zero. The contraction of 
annihilation and okay why is this so maybe I should I should explain why this is so but it's very easy to follow so we just defined before that uh, the normal order is is the one where we have the uh, this guy is already in the normal order so the normal order is the one where we have the annihilation operators where we have the annihilation operators to the left and to the right. Sorry, I have a problem with left and right. Can you imagine me being in the military service? Actually, I had to do this left, right. That was really no fun. So this already is in the normal order. And the contraction is defined as the difference between the operators in their order as they are given here, in the arbitrary order, minus the normal order. And this here, this contraction is obviously zero because it's already in the appropriate order. So the difference between AB minus AB is obviously zero. This guy is also already in the normal order. This guy is also already in the normal order. The only one that we have to define is this one here. So the contraction is the difference between the order I've written down here, arbitrary order, minus the normal order. This is this one. And this here is our basic unto commutator rule. This gives delta dq. So a contraction only yields a final value if the annihilation operator is to the left and the creation operator to the right. Only then can the contraction yield something. And furthermore, this is a scalar. This is no longer a complicated wave function object. It's just a scalar quantity. Yeah? It's just a delta function. So it's either 0 or it's 1. So it's a value. It's a number. It makes life even easier. This is not so important. The only other thing I want to mention here, in this context, the normal order is defined for the quasi-particle operators. So the normal order, and this is already what I alluded to here, the normal order is defined for these operators, i and a, and not for ci or ca dagger. Good. Now, weak theorem essentially tells, and I will not go through this. I've decided to make a shortcut here. Wick theorem tells, and this is the power of it, for a vacuum expectation value, so if you want, if you are evaluating the vacuum expectation value of a series of creation and annihilation operator, only the fully contracted terms survive. This is an extremely powerful theorem that really helps a lot in doing perturbation theory. I know you can find paper by, I don't know, Presta. Where, where it's cumbersomely derived third order perturbation theory, second order perturbation theory. All this is not necessary if you understand those theorems. You can actually write down third order terms, fourth order terms. Probably beyond that, it's getting really tough. But in principle, these theorems allow you to do any arbitrary order of perturbation theory on the back of an envelope. Imagine, I mean, third order equations are really, really difficult already to derive. But again, these theorems, in principle, allow you to get total energy changes in any order on the back of an envelope in the ball bag. Here is, again, the important equation. For a vacuum expectation value, only fully contracted terms survive. What does it mean? So if you have here any order of creation and annihilation operators, all you need to draw is any possible contractions, pairs of contractions, and that's it. Contractions are scalar, so even the wave function is kind of gone. Kind of, right? So it's gone because these are scalars. So essentially, there's no longer the need for the ground state wave function. Of course, this applies only if you, have a, if you need to evaluate the expectation value for a ground state wave function and for the hartree fock wave function. Let's go back to our gelman low theorem. The way I've written it here, these are vacuum ground states. This is a vacuum ground state. It's the artifact determinant. So these are vacuum ground states. And these here are vacuum expectation values. So the combination of Wick theorem and the gelman low theorem allows you to calculate the correlation energy or essentially write it down compactly. This here is the ground state wave function or the artifact wave function. It's really this is the ground state wave function or artifact wave function. This is exactly a vacuum expectation value in the, in the common way it's defined in quantum many-body theory. 
Only we have redefined things a little bit. OK, quickly, we have done a few things here. Uh, for the normal order, we have done, well, it's not me that has, has done it. Actually, you can find it in many books. We have only uh, changed a little bit the reference. The reference is now a Hartley Fock reference. And we have redefined a little bit how the normal order is. This is the only thing I've essentially done. Oh, now I know where I'm going in the wrong direction, dreadfully. So, good. Let's be practical and just show you what you can do with this theorem. This here is our many-body Hamiltonian in second quantization. It's essentially the perturbative term that we have. That's the perturbation we switch on. This guy. So the combination of Gelman low theorem, so this is our perturbation, and we just do lowest order perturbation theory. Actually, this is first order perturbation theory. So we apply it, we just look at this value, and we assume this u of eta is just one. So we set the u to one. Then we just need to evaluate Hartley-Fock determinant, H10, and that's the other Hartley-Fock determinant. We just need to evaluate essentially this, and we cancel and drop this particular term. This is H1. This is our perturbation. And what I've told you, and that's, that's Wick's theorem, if you want to evaluate the vacuum expectation value, this is a vacuum expectation value. This is the Hartley-Fock determinant. Hartley-Fock is our vacuum state. All we need to evaluate are all possible contractions, for instance, A, B, C, D, A, C, contraction between those two, B, D, contraction between those two, A, D, B, C. These are all possible permutations that we have. There are no more. Now, many of these contractions are zeros. For instance, if there are two occupied orbitals, or there are two, two annihilation operators, it will be zero. This will be zero. So essentially, a lot of terms will drop out. And it turns out that the only non-vanishing term is annihilation to the left and the same creation to the right. This is this here. This is the only contraction that will give non-zero terms. So it's an annihilation to the left and the same creation to the right. This is the delta function, same creation to the right, right and left. And the only non-vanishing term is annihilation to the left and it's the same creation to the right. These operators are, however, ordered a little bit. Well, these are the standard quantum field creation and annihilation operators. Be careful, these are these guys here, not these transformed ones. And it turns out the only the contribution that we will have is if the right operator is a whole creation operator. So if this here, ci, is equal i dagger plus, only then we will have a contribution. So these are the only terms that survive in first order. So it's actually this CS must be essentially this CS must be a I dagger operator. Now this this looks strange. Yeah, essentially this this CS must be L dagger operator and this CR must be a K dagger operator. And only if I is equal to K you get a contribution. So only if i is equal to k, then you get a contribution. Only if l dagger is equal to j, you get a contribution. So only if these two guys are the same and these two guys are the same, you get a contribution. And this is round, written down here. In, in my next lecture, I will use a much simpler reasoning to derive the same equation. You will see that later that this can be done really easier in first order perturbation theory. This is a little bit complex. There's an easier way to do this, and I will come back to this, so don't worry too much if you don't understand it. But this here is exactly the Hartley-Fock energy for the ground state determinant. Good. Now we can do this in higher order. We can do it in first order, for instance. So essentially what we do is, here we have again the vacuum expectation value, as we obtain it from gelman low theorem. And now we take the first order term for this. So we just take the first order term for the Hamiltonian H1, or for the time propagation operator. So this is our time propagation operator. And remember, we propagate from minus infinity to time t0. Minus infinity was Hartley-Fock. Minus infinity was Hartley-Fock. And the t is equal to 0, we get over to the true ground state. And 
essentially in the lowest order, in the first, in the second order perturbation theory, this involves just H, the Hamiltonian H1. This here is our uh, interacting Hamiltonian. This is the adiabatic switching that we use to switch on the Hamiltonian. This here comes from the interaction picture. Recall, I told you that in the interaction picture, we have to left multiply and right multiply with the independent zero order Hamiltonian. And essentially, for this here, we use a spectral representation. And I'm not going through that. Essentially, this is our full Hamiltonian, our full time dependent Hamiltonian. Here is the slow switching. The only thing I want to say here is that here are now our creation operators. And any creation operator that comes up also involves a time propagation operator. Again, I will come back to this and show it in a more intuitive way later what this does. But look at this. What this essentially does is if you create a particle, then here you have in the interaction picture, you have actually and this here is in the imaginary time, but you don't need to worry about the imaginary time. This is just how a particle would propagate in Schrodinger's picture. Yeah, in Schrodinger's picture, a particle gets e to the i epsilon pt. If you propagate a particle, this is the kind of phase factor it requires as it propagates in time. Yeah. So any creation operator will involve this here similarly. So this here is an annihilation operator, and that involves essentially propagation of a hole, and therefore the negative sign. So any annihilation operator that will later come up will have these exponents essentially in there. This is just rewriting the original perturbation into this interaction picture. Nothing has happened here, but we have rewritten our Hamiltonian H1, our perturbation, into this interaction picture. That's all I have essentially done. So now we need to do again with theorem. And very quickly, it becomes cumbersome. Now we have eight creation, and, sorry, four creation and four annihilation operators. And it gets really like a complete mess. So this is done here. And I mean, it doesn't really make fun. And now you might say, why the hell we then, do I then use this, these crazy theorems, right? I mean, I've told you before, this is very powerful. But now you have all these possible contractions. Oh, it's dreadful, right? So it doesn't look like a lot of help. And that's where diagrams come in. Diagrams are an exact one-to-one -one correspondence between complicated algebraic expressions and graphical representations. They are very clever means. And if you want so, if you haven't understood anything, that's still OK now. You can still come back at this point, OK? The diagrams are lovely, OK? Because they are exceedingly powerful. And they just maybe forget about everything I've told you. I've tried to give you the background of all this. But you don't need it. That's a good point. From now on, you just need to love Goldstone diagrams. Because they allow you to forget about the complicated derivations and do everything on the back of an envelope. Actually, I learned Goldstone diagrams first and only then looked up the series ones. Maybe what I want to show you is you should read the theories once. But you can also instead just use the rules I will give you now for Goldstone diagrams and construct perturbation theory of an arbitrary order. So here are my diagrams. And I've tried to capture how they work. Here we have a Coulomb interaction. And here we have the creation and annihilation operators. Any creation operator has an outgoing line. Any annihilation operator has an ingoing line. So here we have an ingoing line, and here we have an outbound line. Goldstone diagrams are time ordered. So there is always a time that propagates in these slides inconsistency between me and my later slides, the Felix slides and my later slides. Time here propagates only from, from up, from the bottom here up. So time propagates upwards. In my later slides, it will always propagate downwards. So essentially, let's look what this means. This means an electron comes in in an orbital s. This means an electron comes in in an orbital r. And this here means that you annihilate those electrons at this point here. And then create at that point here an electron p 
and an electron Q, and they continue their propagation in time. This here is the Coulomb interaction, and the way you connect it is P and S are at the same space point, and R and Q are at the same space point. So essentially what we do here is we convert the algebraic expression here into this diagram here. These are the two particle operators, the Coulomb interaction. These are one particle operator. So we have an electron coming in here and an electron moving out here. So essentially we come in here with an electron, we annihilate it at the position Q, and we create a new electron in the channel P. And this here is our Coulomb interaction, PPQ. So this is essentially a graphical rule how to convert these second quantization terms into graphics. So the one electron potential in this talk at least will be replaced by a dashed blob. That's usually done in quantum chemistry with one incoming and one outgoing vertex. And the contraction operators, I don't know what that means, forget it. So here is one example. This is the Hartree-Fock term we had just a few slides before. This here is the Hartree-Fock term we had just a few slides before. This is this here. And actually, we can use diagrams to represent this. So we have here a Coulomb line and a particle I propagating here to this point. And here it's a particle J propagating backwards. And here's the Coulomb line. This is an exact con conversion of this diagram here that we had a few slides before. Just look back. And if you apply those rules I've given you here, you can immediately convert the algebraic expression that we had in first order perturbation theory to this nice little diagram here. Now, believe me that this is much easier to remember than this early guy. Actually, a lot of physicists, including very smart ones like Eugene Reining, they don't like diagrams for some reason. And then they do 10 pages of derivation. And I look one minute and tell them these indices need to be swapped. This is just by the means of diagrams, yeah, which are extremely powerful and extremely compact to represent the equation. This here is the Hartree interaction I've drawn before. So this here is the diagram that we had three slides before. This is how I wrote it down. And now you use these rules here. Here you have a closed circle because I is coming in twice here as I and I dagger. And the way it's connected and the rules I've given in here means that they run back into the same vertex here. And here J runs also into the same vertex here using just these rules. So what happens is essentially that this vertex connects back to that vertex by the virtue that P and S are the same. So if P and S are the same, you reconnect the vertex. If Q and R are the same, if these two are the same, R and, yeah, Q and R are the same, this is here, these two are the same, they need to be reconnected essentially graphically. Another rule I need to say here is if they are closed loops, you only need to sum over the occupied states. That comes also from Wick's theorem. And it essentially means any closed loops. And also, if the loops are at equal times, it's always only a sum over occupied states. So I will not walk through this. I will not walk through that. I will leave. Ah, this would be. Well, these are derivations that are a little bit complicated, but you don't need to know that. So essentially, at the end of the day, all you need to do is you need to draw all possible diagrams that you can figure out yourself, all possible permutations, where the diagrams need to be completely closed. And for instance, in second order, you have at most two Coulomb lines. And try yourself a Coulomb line. Uh, I had really too little time. Um, it's really difficult. <sighs> okay, but we will come back to it. It's good news. So we will have we have later in my later lectures. I will actually only use the Goldstone diagrams, and you will see a lot of examples. Okay, and I will give you again an introduction to it. Here is, for instance, a second order diagram. A Coulomb line. A Coulomb line here. This here is a electron line. And since time here in these slides moves upwards, this is a whole line. This is an electron line. So whenever the arrows go in my slides, when they go down, in those slides, if they go down, it's a, it's a hole. If they go up, it's essentially an, an electron. 
And this is one of the few lines. Now, let's try to do some exercises. Imagine that you have two Coulomb lines, wiggly lines, and try to draw all diagrams where you observe the previous rules. So actually, you have two Coulomb lines. And from each of these Coulomb lines, you can have errors going out, two errors. And they need to be fully connected. There are not so many possible choices, right? You can connect those two. Uh, and then either you can connect those two, or you can cross those two. Right? This is about all you can do. And this is kind of shown on those diagrams. Yeah, here are really all possible permutations of two Coulomb lines. And these are the electron hole lines. So you can connect those like this. You can go from here to here. Well, you can swap i and j. So you can swap those two. But that's the same. Topologically, it's the same diagram as above. This is another topologi topological identical diagram to this. And this is, again, the same diagram. So obviously, the many swaps you can have yield topologically always the same diagram. The only other one I haven't drawn here is this cross diagram. This is about the only other diagram you can have. So Goldstone diagrams essentially are extremely compact representation of these complicated algebraic equations. Here is a third order diagram, for instance. Essentially, there are many more, but you can draw all by drawing three Coulomb lines, one, two, three, three Coulomb lines, and then connecting the diagrams according to the rules I have given. And now the second point is we can immediately translate this Goldstone diagram to an algebraic expression. How do you do that? It's very simple. So for any arrow pointing up, you introduce A. A means an unoccupied state. For any arrow that points down, you introduce J or I. This is, an point, this is one pointing up. It's B. This is uh, C. So it's a previously unoccupied state. And this is an occupied state, K. Now you have to insert the Coulomb, in, the Coulomb integrals. Coulomb integrals are V, A, J, C, I. These are the Coulomb integrals. They come essentially from the vertices. So each of these vertices represents a, or each of these Coulomb lines represents a Coulomb interaction. And now the denominators are very easy to determine. You just put the branch cut here. So you put the line here and put into the denominators all energies that are all eigenenergies, all Hartree-Fock eigenenergies that are along those lines. So here it's epsilon A, epsilon J, epsilon I, epsilon B. This is unfortunately again wrong. Here it's epsilon A, epsilon I, epsilon C, epsilon D. So there's something wrong in here, unfortunately. So these diagrams are not correct. So it's very easy, A, J, I, B. This is the first denominator. The second denominator is A, I, C, K. These would be the right denominators that you should have. OK, there are also rules how to determine the sign. The sign can be determined from the topology, and it's given by minus 1 to the power of L plus H, where L is the number of closed loops. Closed loops, what does that mean? Here we have a closed loop where you can move around in this loop. And here is another closed loop where you can move around this loop. So this is a so-called closed fermionic loop. So you can move in this loop without interruption. And that's a closed fermionic loop. So all you need to do is you need to count the number of fermionic loops. And you need to count the number of holes line, hole lines. And that gives you the sign. The number of hole lines are essentially, in this case, those that point upwards, A, B, and C. So the number of lines that go upwards determine the number of whole lines. And the number of, sorry, the number of whole lines are actually the one, yes, I, J, K. Yes, I've counted it correctly. And the number of closed fermion groups in this case is two. So this gives you the sign. Jesus. OK, next time I take double uh, four hours. That's clear now. I'm really sorry for this mess. OK, I will skip the link cluster theorem. The link cluster theorem is very important. But I will not do this. Essentially, it allows you to determine and use only those diagrams that are completely linked. So those that are unlinked. So you could, for instance, draw diagrams that are unlinked. 
and there would be many more diagrams that come up, and those don't count. So in this perturbation theory, you only need to include those diagrams that completely link. So do we need this? Yes, you want food, right? Next time. Yes, I'm almost finished. Seriously, I'm, I'm not joking. I'm almost finished. I will finish after this slide. I know I have 10 more slides in principle, but I will not show it. So maybe I will come back to it indeed next time. Uh, probably second lecture. So these are all second order diagrams all second order Goldstone diagrams that you can possibly draw in second order. I want to show this because I will show it again later. So what's the property? Second order diagrams are those that have one Coulomb line, this counts, so two Coulomb lines, or one effective interaction, and one Coulomb line, or two effective interactions. These are all second order terms. These are the one electron interactions that we have switched off so we have switched off Hartree-Fock. These here are Coulomb cells. So this is second order, two of these blobs, second order, 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 and second order. These are all possible diagrams we can draw in second order. There are not anymore. And we can actually transverse and convert those diagrams into a compact perturbation equation. Exactly according to the rules I've given you before. You just draw a line. And then you label the states, you put in the Coulomb integrals, and you put in the denominators. The sign can also be determined. Same here, same here, same here, same here, same here. If you start from the Arthur Fock reference, and that's a nice thing why many people do that, if you start from the Arthur Fock reference, all these diagrams drop out. So it turns out if you start from Arthur Fock, these diagrams by some trick that's called Brillouin theorem, become exactly zero. I will show you this a little bit later in a different way, in a slightly different language. All these terms exactly drop out. The only one that survives in second order are those here. And these are called muller placet perturbation theory terms. These are exactly the terms in lowest order perturbation theory. If you start from DFT, these diagrams need to be included. Yes, I know people need to eat now. I will skip this because I will talk about propagators later. And I will probably skip the Feynman diagrams anyway. Yes. Miss Dett, I thank you for your attention. And I'm really deeply sorry that this was far too much. Typically, for the first case it's presented, it's always too much. Anyway, thank you. We will come back to many things.